So I want to start off today's study by uh, um, talking about the way the, our world is run, especially in the people around us, how we know things function, and the way things function are uh, so self-confident, so self-dependent on everything. You grow up and you kind of expect that um, I have to be the most self-dependent person. I gotta have my money down just through me. You know, I can't be dependent on others. I just have to get my confidence, just be a, a, my own source. I need to be my own source. Uh, and that's how we're trained. That's how we're driven. That's surely how I was driven. I know that's how my every day, morning, day and night was run. I just had to be on top of everything. My own source of everything. That's how the world is run. And the world really doesn't like weakness, right? The, weak, the world doesn't appreciate or c commend weakness. It's looked down upon. It's really looked down upon. Um, people who don't know how to do things are kind of, you know, at times, you know, kind of harshly treated to be able to be your own source for things. There's nothing wrong with learning how to do abilities and stuff like that. We're getting towards the spirit. I'm talking about the spirit of uh, people have almost a pride in them. And they just want to be the source of everything. Everything comes from them, my way, the way I want it. And weakness is something that's shunned. Insecurity is shunned. You know, those things are just completely gone. But... In God's kingdom, God is actually after the weak ones. God doesn't need strong people. He doesn't need weak people. But he desires to show his strength through weak people, through weakness. That's what he likes to do. It's in his, um, his delights is to find the weak and use them. But I say all this to say that our 12 disciples actually kind of had this kind of worldliness in them where they really loved um, the thinking of the world they wanted to be the greatest and we know we did a mini series on on that by God's grace that they were really arguing amongst themselves I'm the greatest no I'm the greatest and it's kind of shocking that for three years they were in this place they were in this place um, the disciples had this in them. And we know how we got treated. Jesus so gently unpacked to them. He said, guys, come on. You know, this is not how my kingdom's run. It's not going to be this way with you. And at the same time, he showed such love to them. He gets up from the table and he uh, washes their feet. And on top of that, he says, I'm giving you guys a kingdom. Because you guys have stayed with me in all my trials. You guys have stayed with me. And it's such, so sweet, so precious, such an intimate moment of love in between, between Christ and his disciples. But, but, however, this doesn't mean that the consequences of our sins won't catch up with us. Christ will love us in the middle of our sins, but the consequences add up. Whatever you reap, that you'll also what? So, they had been sowing in pride for the longest time. The consequences have caught up tonight. Tonight. We're going to see these consequences. Turn with me to Luke 22. 31 to 34. <clears throat> Only Luke mentions the details of this story here. Luke has a really unique Last Supper. A good amount of it is unique to Luke. Let's look at these words that the evangelist Luke mentions. Luke 22, 31 to 34. Listen to the word of God that's going to be read. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you 
that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both, both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. The first detail I'm going to mention, I wanted to stick in your mind. This is at the Last Supper. You might think that's a given, but keep that in mind, okay? The setting is at the Last Supper in the upper room of a house in Jerusalem. Just keep that in mind, and we'll touch back on that later. That's the setting. The disciple of the hour is Peter. Why is Peter addressed here? Why, is it, why does Jesus say, Simon, Simon? Because likely, he was the most passionate one in this dispute. He was likely the most argumentative, burning man in this room. He filled with pride. I'm the greatest. And because he, remember, he was one of, uh, among the three that were closest to Jesus. He would have had an extra... Uh, uh, elevation above the other disciples, James, John, and Peter. They were always closest with Christ. So he has something over them. But the pride is just getting to his heart. And out of all names, Jesus says, Simon, 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 Simon. He's the most passionate person at this table. While, while Peter is sitting at this Passover meal, which they've done three times with Christ by now, little does he know that his life is about to change forever. His life is about to change forever. Look what he says, Simon, Simon, behold. The word behold, once you read it in scripture, you get this sense that it's a, it's a shift. It's a, it's a shift in uh, something new is occurring. Something sudden almost. Something almost that surprise. Behold, like something not out of the ordinary. Not, some, not, not, not like we walk outside and we see cars. That's, that's normal, but behold. There's a plane, there's a helicopter right above our church. You know, like, it's usually used in the setting of something to almost grab someone's attention towards something. And then, but before he says, behold, he says, Simon, Simon. There is two things that you should observe in Bible study. Repetition and tone. What's the tone here? Gentleness. Some commentators have said it's tinged with sadness. Yeah, or disappointment. Tinged with disappointment. It's kind of like when he uh, went to Paul on Damascus Road. Saul, Saul. It's Saul, Saul. 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 Like, Saul. It's like Saul. disappointment, Why? but it's not like condemning. Mm -hmm. I feel like there might be a sprinkle of compassion in there too. There is a sprinkle. Of course, you just, you know... Um, after he was washing his feet, you remember he told Peter, your feet are clean. You're clean. But not all of you. Talking about Judas. He's expressed a lot of love towards Peter tonight. There's no condemnation in his voice. Uh, you know who else Jesus said to their names twice to? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, but their person I'm referring to. Martha, Martha. Remember when Martha was so distracted, busy in the house? That's compassion. In that context, we see that's like all compassion, all gentleness. So there is a subtle rebuke that goes on that he has, but it's such a, that one's really endearing. And then you have something in the Old Testament. Who knows, who remembers? Abraham, Abraham! Whenever Abraham was about to put that dagger through his son, Abraham, Abraham was said by the angel. That's urgency to get him to stop. So we look here at the context to understand what type of, tone is going on here and we know that something really bad is about to happen to Peter so with that context we understand that the tone would probably have been Simon Simon to disappointment sadness calls him by his old name calls him by his old name he doesn't say Peter Peter Simon, Simon. Remember Jesus gave him the name Peter? He called him as Simon and named him Peter. Why? Because he's acting like his old self. 
He's not acting like his new self. He's uh, not what he should be. And oftentimes, Jesus more so called him Simon, Simon Peter, than he called him Peter. He did. The, the name Peter is mentioned here later. Uh, but Simon, Simon is mentioned. What does Simon mean? In, uh, in Hebrew, Simon means to listen, to hear. Okay? Oh, what? Sorry. Yeah. So loud. Yeah. I didn't hear. yeah. In, to listen. in the Hebrew, Simon means to listen, to hear. But it's not just uh, just like audibly hearing. It's you hearing and obeying. And that's it's called Shema. That's that's Simon. That's what that's what Simon means. We always should look at the meaning of uh, people's names because if you look at Matthew, early in Matthew, it says, "And they called him Emmanuel, which means God with us." Scripture clearly gives names on purpose with a definite meaning to it, and we should always look. He says Simon, Simon, his old name, which means to listen, to hear. Um, why do I mention all this? Because Jesus is doing everything in his power to get Peter's attention. Everything. He's doing a lot of things. Christ clearly sees unrepentant pride in Peter. And he sees this as a great danger, a great danger. Jesus is very solemnly warning Peter here. Very solemnly. In fact, the words he says after, Satan has demanded to sift you. He never says to anyone else, ever, anyone else ever again. In, in his life on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you look at it, he just never speaks these words to another person. And he says, behold, like... Look, look here, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. He mentioned multiple things many times, right? What's an example of stuff he said multiple times? The first will be last, the last will be first. Whoever humbles, himself, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. He said that so many times. Whoever humbles himself... Uh, will be exalted. He mentioned these things so many times. But you know what Jesus is doing? He gets his attention. And then he says, something's going on, Peter, that you have no idea about. You know what Jesus is doing? He peels back the curtain of the spiritual world. The spiritual realm. He pulls this curtain back and it's almost as if Peter is now looking into the spiritual invisible realm and Jesus is saying do you see what I'm saying he's pull Jesus pulls back the veil of the spiritual realm and makes visible what is invisible you know it says in Ephesians we wrestle not against flesh and blood physical things but against principalities and powers that are invisible and Jesus is letting him know something that Peter would never have known about if Jesus never said it. He tells him about the invisible. It must have been of such importance for Peter to see that. And it's in our Bibles, guys. So it's important for us to see this. So Jesus unmasks this thing. What is he showing? Satan, the devil, Lucifer demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat some other translations say stuff differently satan has asked to sift you nasb says can you read yours <clears throat> simon simon behold satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat this is one of the only times where um nasb doesn't have a good translation uh, well it gives a note it says, or obtained by asking. Yeah. Uh, even MacArthur said in his thing, commentary, the word permission is not there in the original. Um, and the LSB removes it. But that's implied. That's the truth there. That's the truth there. 
I mean, Satan can't do anything apart from God's permission. Absolutely. But when it comes to translating, translators don't take on the job of interpretation. Yeah. That is there. There is a permission going on there. But it's important for us to know the word demanded. Satan demanded. Demand means to request urgently and forcefully. Whatever Satan wants out of Peter, it's with urgency. It's with urgent hatred. This is not a light thing that Satan is doing behind the scenes. This is not light. The urgency of Satan demanding ought to have shaken up Peter. He should have sent chills up his spine. I lay this all as a foundation of what's coming. What does it mean that Satan demanded to sift him? What does it mean to be sifted? What is sifting? Sifting. Cutting, chopping. Yeah? When you sift wheat and you chop it, right? There is a part of that, yeah. Sifting wheat, like, yeah, yeah it's, it's like, it, really it's like not the, it's not the, it's not the chopping. Is it the cleaning of it, where it's like, like, like taking out the grains and stuff, like sifting through something? So sifting is, once they would get the wheat in the fields, they cut it. And they put it in what in like a a sieve. A sieve, you know what a sieve is? You know that 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 netted that netted uh, kitchen tool which you would like um, put in and you put something like water so yeah, that's a sieve. And what they would do is um, they would get the wheat and put it in like a, a big sieve, like a big like sometimes uh, um, a lined basket at times and they would shake this thing up they would shake it up so that the chaff which is the bad part of the wheat and the grain the good part can be separated okay so the person who's doing this normally a woman would do it they would just shake 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 and as they're shaking the good grain is falling to the bottom but the chaff is staying on top, okay? This was the point. It was. It says in biblical times, uh, wheat or other grain was sifted through a sieve. As it was shaken violently, the dirt, small stones, lumps, and other impurities that clung to the grain during the threshing process would separate. In order to sift, you have to shake the sieve. You have to shake it. So it moves away from the chaff and the grain, the good part falls out and it's separate from the bad. Violent shaking. Violent shaking. Alan Carr writes that sifting is an agricultural term that refers to the savage process of separating the chaff of the wheat from the grain. It's a purifying process, guys. This is, like, if you look at it, people still do this today. I even saw a YouTube video on this of people today who still do this. It's a purifying process. It's a really good thing to separate the chaff from the grain. What's the implication of this spiritually? That believers can be handed over to Satan himself and when believers are handed over to Satan, a great shaking occurs in that person's life. Like Job. Like Job. Violent shaking, heavy shaking, repeated trials, difficult trials. I happen to have gotten badly sifted in 2020 early in my thing. Many of us have experienced um, sifting seasons of immense trial. You want to share something? I was going to say there's a verse in Alice 9-9. Nine, nine. 
Yeah, he's a sniper. Yeah. yeah, and it says like, well, God says like he does it to Israel, but not a part of all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. As I was doing my study, that verse is in there. That is a different thing. That is a different uh, circumstance with the same word of sifting. You know, you get an idea of even then it's, it brings down the same uh, purpose of sifting. It's meant to. You, so, so can you read that verse? Listen to what I said about the agriculture. Can you read that so we can understand what sifting is? For behold, I am commanding, and I will shake the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is shaken in a seed, but not a kernel will fall to the ground. Ah, uh -huh, you see that? The, he did the shaking, but guess what didn't fall down? Any good stuff. You see that? It's like basically like the even sanctification means to set apart. So that's like it's basically what causes sanctification that sets apart. Yeah, many of us have experienced this times of immense trial. But why does this happen? Why does this happen? Why does God give permission to sift us like this? What is the purpose of sifting? I have three reasons. The first two that I'm going to mention, we're just going to briefly go over. And we're going to park at the third one. So if you ever are going in throughout your faith and immense trial just falls on your life here are three reasons at times it could be only one reason as to why it's happening at times it could be all three number one reason as to why god grants satan to sift us is this Sifting is permitted in order to silence Satan. What do I mean that? What do I mean by that? You have a person like Job in the Old Testament. Job. It says a man greatest in the land. God fearing a man who turned away from evil. And then Satan came one day and give me him. Give me that guy. And Job goes through this immense suffering and at the very end he never got a reason why from God as to why God allowed this to happen. But God did speak to Satan and he says, you see my servant Job here? You see him? Try him. Go ahead and try him. That is a case of God using immense trials in our life for the purpose of silencing the invisible enemy behind the scenes. So sometimes it could just come as if everything is going well, you're even doing well spiritually, and then bang. Reason number two. God can sift people with immense trials at times for the purpose of Making you sympathize with other people. Making you sympathize with other people. Often the greatest sufferers become the greatest sympathizers. Having been in the place where we needed sympathy ourselves, we become more sympathetic towards others. You know, you guys know what Job called his three friends? Three, Job, whenever he was going through this horrible suffering, his three friends were trying to comfort him. You know what Job calls them? Miserable comforters. Miserable comforters. I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Job 16.2 and listen to 2 Corinthians 1, 4-6. God comforts us in all, our, in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ abound to us, so also our comforts abound through Christ. And whether we are afflicted it is for your comfort. 
and salvation. Or whether we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is working in your perseverance in the same sufferings which we also suffer. It's reason number two. God can see you're just not someone who really sympathizes with others. And you need some pruning to feel that comfort for others. It's reason number two. But the main reason of sifting, which we see most in our Bibles, Old Testament and New Testament, the third reason as to why God allows sifting is because God allows Satan to sift us to get rid of unrepentant sin in our life. Okay? Unrepentant sin in our life has to be gone. Because we're preaching, not on Job, we're not preaching on Job today, we're preaching on Peter. And because we're preaching on Peter, we are dealing with his context and his life and the circumstance here. Sure, God allowed that sifting for Job, maybe to silence Satan, but Job also had sin in his life. Could he not have been more refined? Of course. All have sinned and fall short, the glory of God, Job included. Job included. Listen to this quote. Some sins are so deeply in us that in order for God to make us holy, he steps back and lets us learn the lesson the hard way by releasing the leash, the leash of Satan and having Satan run towards us. Satan's on a leash. He's on a leash. He can't do anything without God's permission. But whenever God sees us misbehaving in our sin, at times, God steps back and he lets go of that sovereign arm. And Satan is permitted to do whatever that God allowed him to do to us. And in case of Job, his children died. All his animals were killed. Lost property, lost health. And guess what Satan did? He kept a quarrelsome wife in his life. He's that smart. He'll get rid of all the people that are not a problem. And he kept a quarrelsome wife in there. He could do whatever he wants that God allows. That God allows. If we've been in the faith for a while, there are some sins in us that are personality sins. Sins that are a part of our personality. I have mine have mind that I'm daily fighting against and at times just don't seem to make much progress but we each of us have a sin that's much closer to our heart and our roots and our personality whereas other sins are kind of over here stuff that are intertwined with our personality some people might have colder personalities they have to fight that. Some people might have really introverted, shy personalities. Some people might have really boastful, loud, arrogant, like has to be seen by everyone personalities. And it's stuff like that that's so intertwined in us. It's a part of us. It's in us. And it's only at times by great seasons of trial that God can scourge those sins out of our life. Let me tell you something about, I got converted around 2019. Do you know what sin was intertwined like a DNA? Like DNA was just intertwined in my soul. Lying and manipulation, which border each other. We manipulate, manipulation is deception in so many things. That was, it was so sown in me. I just lied as if it was bleeding. I would lie out of everything, everything. Manipulate everyone around me. And God put me through a horrifying, great trial. I came out of that and I could say I was delivered from that sin. I was delivered from that sin because it took such great trial to peel that thing off my back, out of me. It was surgery. It was surgery. One commentator says this, guys. 
the sifting makes us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes the trial and test are God's method of producing Christ-likeness in His children. The Lord is not concerned only with our salvation to keep us out of hell. He longs to conform us to the image of His Son. And if we are to be like Christ, there must be sifting, suffering, and sorrow. We can never be like Christ without these things. We can never be like Christ. We can never be he heavenly until the earthly is pruned off of us. For a long time now, we see them going through arguments and arguments about who's the greatest. And every time that they do it, Peter has been participating here, and it's been sowing, and it's been sowing, and it's been sowing, and it's been sowing. You want to share something? Yeah, uh, before you move on. Um, I know it's very commonly stated, but James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, um, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials or temptations, uh, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And that goes hand in hand with your last point of making us more like Christ. There's a reason why it says, Consider it all joy. You know, and not a sorrowful thing, uh, because whenever you do encounter these trials, it's it's meant to make you more Christ-like. Right. You might might touch on that later. I have something in mind for that verse a bit later. Sin is like a domino effect. You do one sin, you get angry at someone. Let's say you burst out in anger. Now you're just in such a horrible place. It's almost as if a bunch of locks were unlocked on a bunch of other sins. Once you unlock that door of anger, the door of bitterness opens. The door of lust opens. The door of pride opens. The door of unforgiveness opens. So that sin is like a domino effect. You want to see the domino effect of Peter tonight? He was, it started off with him arguing at a table with his friends on who's greater. And then it went further to Jesus warning him, it's not going to be like this in my kingdom. And then he goes further and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you. What did he say? That's a warning. That's a warning. That's a warning for you to listen and repent. And what does he say? Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then Jesus is still trying with this person. He says another thing. You're going to deny me three times tonight. Where did I say that this section of this text took place today? Last Supper in an upper room in Jerusalem. Now I'm going to say something that you guys might not know. Jesus warns about Peter's three denials two times. Not just once. He warns him two times. Not just once. Why do I say this? Mark 14, 26 to 31 says this. While they're still in that upper room, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Last Supper ended off with them singing a hymn, and they get up and leave. So now they've gone, left Jerusalem, and they're at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Look at this. This is the second time that Peter says this. 
even though they all fall away, I will not. Okay, that's another warning on Peter. You see this domino effect? Warning after warning after warning. He's rejecting them. It's, it's a snowball effect downhill. Now look what Christ says after. Truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice. We've heard that, that the rooster crows once. Mark's only mentions, Mark's the only gospel that mentions the rooster's going to crow twice. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Is Peter going to repent there? No, Mark's gospel said, but Peter said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Let me put it this way. Luke and John mentioned the first warning of the three denials in the upper room in Jerusalem. You look at Luke's gospel and John's gospel, it takes place in the upper room at the Last Supper. Matthew and Mark mention a warning at the Mount of Olives. He's getting warned multiple times. They go to the garden. Jesus leaves uh, nine disciples in the garden. At the entrance of the garden. But he takes Peter, James, and John with him into the garden to pray with him. And as Jesus is agonizing in prayer, he gets up. And he comes back three times to Peter, James, and John. And the disciples. You know what he tells them? We know what he tells them. Watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. But Mark's gospel was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was written by Mark, and Mark was an acquaintance of Peter. So many people have said Mark's gospel is Peter's gospel through the words of Mark. And guess what is recorded in the Gethsemane account in Mark's gospel? Jesus doesn't generally say, you guys ought to watch and pray. It says this, And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, He said to Peter, He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Simon, are you asleep? Could you, Simon, not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He did that three times. Three denials. He's just going and this snowball is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. This all happened within less than 12 hours. All happened within less than 12 hours. How many warnings did Jesus give Peter? Too many to count. He gave him time to repent the easy way. He could have listened to Christ's words and prayed. Right? Is that not the same way with us? Neglecting Bible reading, neglecting prayer. He neglected Christ's words repeatedly, and he neglected prayer. So Jesus is almost saying, you can either repent easily by listening to my words and praying, or you can be like Peter, who grieved the Spirit and made his life a living hell. Jesus is saying, you can either humble yourself, or you can be humble. Choose what you want. You can either humble yourself or be humble. Sifting is at times painful and brutal. A part of the sifting process is that God draws back and has Satan have you and then Satan does whatever God allows Satan to do. Satan can only act in whatever God allows him to do. There's some people who might say, is this God or the devil in my life? Is the devil doing this to me? My friend, Satan can only act in whatever God allows him to do to you. Whatever God allows for you, for him to do to you. You can be like Job or Peter. Peter said he claimed to be the greatest. Job 1.3 says Job was the greatest in the world. <laughs> you see the difference? It's trying to show you there's two people so far apart. And even Job had the presence of God away from him. Even Job had the presence of God away from him. And it says that when Satan got him, it says he was still blameless and he did not sin. 
but the presence of God was gone. Yes, it's true, I will never leave you. That's a promise. But God can never leave you and just step back and move his presence a bit back. So guys, even in the worst of suffering, in the worst of trial, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you just because there might be such immense trial in your life. When God steps back and it, all, it only just seems like Satan is around, that doesn't mean that God has, is done with you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It means that God is doing the most loving thing to you. He's doing the most loving thing to you. Listen to this comforting quote by Charles Spurgeon to those sincere believers who have been sifted, who've really been injured, who've really, like, they're trying, they're, they're doing their hardest to repent, and they just can't get a break. Look what Charles Spurgeon says. I think I see you, poor believer. Tossed about like that wheat, up and down, right and left, in the seed, and in the air, never resting. Perhaps it is suggested to you, God is very angry with me. No, the farmer is not angry with his wheat when he casts it up and down in the seed. And neither is God angry with you. This you shall see one day when the light shall show that love ruled in all your griefs. Elizabeth Elliot says this, God will not protect you from anything that will make you more like Jesus. Right? Jesus even expresses more of his love to him. How? In the next verse he says, even though you're going to fall badly, even though he says you're going to fall badly, um, Amen. He says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Not, you know what people remember? We often remember that um, Jesus says this great denial. He forewarns this great denial of Peter's. But we you know what we often forget? At the same night, he told Peter, I'm telling you, you're going to repent. So there's good news and bad news here. There's both good news and bad news here. We're in Luke 22. We're in Luke 22. Christ was praying for his true disciple, Peter. Right? He was praying for his true disciple, Peter. And not just praying. But it says, in some translations, I don't know, maybe if your guys' Bible have it, but it says, I have prayed earnestly for you. I have prayed fervently for you. And the word pray here can be translated as to beg. To beg. To plead. What does John 17 say? John 17 says, Christ doesn't pray for who? The world. I do not pray for the world. That's a, that's a quote by Jesus Christ. I pray for those whom you have given me. And guess what? If he prayed earnestly, you, this is a, you, you can see that Christ the intercessor here. Christ the man who prayed for others here. And he, whenever he prayed for others, it wasn't like how we pray for others. Just like shallow and we just move on. He got on his knees and he was earnestly and fervently praying for others. That's Christ the intercessor. And he prayed way before this event happened. He was in prayer because he speaks in past tense. I have prayed for you earnestly. I have prayed for you earnestly. Um, you want to say something? Yeah. Because, uh, like, sometimes, like, that, like, you know, if we fall into sin and we think, we might think, oh, God wants us to fall well, for that reason. So we become like, so we become disciplined and become more like Christ. But doesn't this also show that like, that's not true? Like, even though God might allow Satan to attack.
attack, but she's still, it's not his desire for us to fall. It, it's saying that I pray for you, that, your, your, that your faith may not fail. We're going to get there. But, but Peter had the worst sin committed in his entire life tonight. Likely his entire life. So Christ does allow us to fall on our faces, even into sin. Even into sin. He does. Not that he desires it. But he says, you're not going to be dependent on me. How many? When did Peter fall into sin? After how many warnings? You see? So it's not like Christ just throws us off. How many times do we, whenever we're about to fall into sin, do you get thoughts, don't do it. Don't do it. Pray. Memorize a verse. Do something. How many times does it just come in our, come in our heads? We neglect it, we neglect it, we put it off like Peter, and then the fall comes. Christ never desires our fall. That's why he tells us and warns us throughout his spirit over and over again. I don't want you to fall. I'm warning you. But he prays for Peter that once he's fallen, that this sifting may produce a beautiful result in him. Yeah, go ahead. This is like the same thing you said. My mom, like when I talk about this, she used this term where it says that us as the Kudatis were brought to him from the beginning. Bring them to their knees. Yes. Like Absolutely. What did I say in the beginning of the study? God doesn't need strong people. He doesn't need weak people here, either. Weakness is what he desires. Weakness is what he desires. And he loves you too, dear believer. You know why? Because he not only prayed for Peter... He prays for us as well, if you're His. Listen to this comforting verse in Romans 8. Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You ever wonder what Christ is doing in His time after His ascension, up to His second coming? He's doing a whole lot of intercession for people. He's doing a whole lot of intercession for people. So, be comforted. Be comforted. If you're a believer, if your hope is in Christ, and sufferings and trials come your way, remember, remember He prays for you. He not only knows that you're going to fall and be in an hour of great trial, the next time you're in an hour of great trial, not only know that God allowed that to happen, but he prayed that your faith may not fail. It will get better. There's a quote that like, reminded me of what Adama said by Spurgeon. It says, whenever God needs to make a man great, he always breaks him in pieces first. And I just thought it's like, yeah, kind of like right. an English version. It's true. What Christ did for Peter, he's doing night and day for us. We often remember, oh, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. We forget. You're going to, I'm not going to let your faith fail. I'm not going to let your faith fail. I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. It's Romans 8.28, right? God works all things together for our good. Whenever tr trials and suffering like this comes in our life, it's a good thing in Jesus' eyes for his sheep to go through trials and suffering it's a good thing for the true believer because the purpose of sifting is to make them more holy more refined more mature more loving more compassionate more dependent on god more christ-like it's good it's a good thing for the believer it's good but I must say, however, however, sifting isn't always good in its results. Sifting isn't always good. We've been talking about the benefits that it has for the true believer. That when that hour of trial comes and the believer is suffering, and through many things just going wrong in their life, could be even a death of a loved one in Job's case, 
loss of money. The believer has the light at the end of the tunnel that Christ is praying for me and he's with me, even though I might not feel him and never undoes the promise that he's with me and he loves me and he fervently prays on my behalf. And he has the light at the end of the tunnel. And when I, when I get there, however long it takes, some people say Job's trial maybe took two years. But when it comes, when it comes, as Spurgeon said, you'll see that love ruled all those afflictions. Love was what ruled all those afflictions of yours. But contrast, sifting doesn't always bring good results. Think with me here. Think with me here. If this was something that only brought forth good, if this was something that only brought forth good, then why would Satan go and ask Jesus to sift Peter? Why? If this was something that was... It's not like G Satan is going to Peter and saying, Jesus, can you make Peter more pure? He's not saying that. He's asking Jesus to sift Peter. He's asking to sift Peter. And if we've been talking this whole time about the immense, beautiful results, and I'm a living witness of what Christ can do to a believer through sifting at times. You take 40 sermons. One month of sifting could teach you more than those 40 sermons. There's a place for sermons. There's a place for suffering as well in the Christian life. If sifting has this meaning of purification and this meaning of cleansing, then why would Satan want this? You know why he would want this? Because Satan, in this shaking, is trying to keep the chaff and blow away the grain. He's trying to sift. But he wants another thing to stay and another thing to go. In God's idea of sifting, God's end goal is for the grain to come down and remain and the, and the chaff to be thrown away. But when S Satan desires to sift someone, he desires the opposite. I want all the grain gone. I only want the bad lumps, the chaff to remain. Satan's end goal of sifting is for the grain to be thrown out. One commentator says, Satan desires that in the sifting process, no wheat, no grain shall remain, but that all, like Judas, be blown away like the chaff. Sifting can be really dangerous, guys. It can be really dangerous. Really, really dangerous. I remember listening to an RC Spoil clip about this passage, and he was like saying how believers have, like, believers or non believers have zero chance against Satan, like, apart from God. Like, it's not even close. Like, we're like toys in his hand, like, like putty. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous what Satan can do with you if God gives him the permission, or even the non believers, what Satan does is. It's not like we're co even close to Satan, so it's the and the sift like wheat is so that's why the imagery is there because it's like nothing. They play, he can play with us if God allows it. Yeah, it's crazy. So also like in that process of sifting, that we know he's saying we will eliminate the bad. Satan can see the bad, and in the future he could try to reincorporate that and use that in the future and slowly like bring it back if he wanted to. He's a, he's a scribe. Isn't it interesting that if there is any New Testament writer that had to describe Satan as one animal, Peter, out of all people, calls him a lion. Not just a lion, but a roaring lion. He isn't trying to minimize Satan. He tries to put an image in your mind to scare you. And he says he prowls around looking for someone to devour as a, and as Adana said he'll walk by you and he'll see those personality sins in your life he'll see a part of your armor that's not covered 
and that ignites him. He's really looking there. He's gonna check to see which part of your armor is not fully on. He's gonna check. Sifting can be really dangerous, not just because Satan is a lot stronger than us. Not, not just that. That's a given. But there's a greater danger behind this. Sifting. A greater danger. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to say something. Um, not only did Jesus pray because he deeply loved Peter. Do you know what else? You know what's another reason as to why Christ prayed so fervently about this? Because Christ knew that being sifted was no light thing. Not only did he just do it for his affection for Peter, but there's a great part here that Christ knew. If I don't intercede now, this is going to be so dangerous. Satan is demanding and Christ is urgently praying. The spiritual realm knows more that we don't. What does Jesus pray for specifically? What does he pray for? If he had to pray for anything, what does Jesus pray for? Keep in mind, he's praying for a man who's been walking with him for three years. You understand that? He's been walking with someone who's in the closer group of the apostles. He's not the outer group. He's not praying for Philip. He's praying for the inner three. He's praying for Peter. A man who's been walking with God himself for three years. And out of all things, what's Jesus' request? That his faith wouldn't fail. That Peter's faith may not fail. That's so interesting, guys. That, listen, listen. Jesus recognized that there are certain things that can be done to someone that can officially fail someone's faith. He recognizes that. He recognizes there are certain things that can be done that can officially fail someone's faith. Certain things can be done that can flatline someone's faith. Out of all things, Jesus prays, Father, don't let his faith fail. You know why? Because this area that Peter was about to walk into is an area where many people's faith officially fails. What's the sin that Peter's going to commit against Christ? Deny him. What is Jesus saying about denying in the Bible? What does he say about people who deny him before men? Wow. You know what Christ says earlier? If you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my father. You're not a Christian. You're not. You're not. Christ said those words, and he recognizes this man's about to deny him three times. There's danger here. This is deep waters. This is no light thing. This was on the... Jesus is about to face the wrath of God, and he takes... Time to fervently intercede for Peter the week of this immense suffering. This denying Christ publicly before people is an eternal rope that you walk on. And if you slip here, it's fatal. This is an eternal rope you're walking on. Publicly denying Christ can hold the effect of official and final apostasy. Apostasy. Actually, whenever we speak about apostasy, which is a getting to a place of no return, if we look at this subject in our Bibles, if we look at the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is telling them, don't turn back. Don't turn back. Don't denounce your faith. Don't do it. Because if you do it, You've officially apostatized. There's no return. It's deadly. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. You might say, well, we're saved by faith alone. Yes, but whenever God gives someone saving faith, it looks a certain way. 
and you know how it looks? They don't end up denying Christ. Peter's denial was not a final denial. It was a moment of slip-up. But whenever Christ said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father, he's looking at a person who's just con constantly trying to run to comfort. Run to comfort. They don't want to take their cross up. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. Jesus took this very seriously and earnestly and fervently prayed for Peter. But let me ask you guys this, as I've been touched on earlier. What does it mean for someone's faith to fail? What does it mean for someone's faith to fail? The Greek word for fail is talking about to stop, to cease. Let me ask you guys this. Did, it, did Peter's faith fail? No. Why? Because he repented, right? It says, when you have turned again, you will strengthen your brothers. So we know, if we want to understand what it means to have a failed faith, why don't we look at someone who didn't have a failed faith, right? And we know Peter in our context didn't because Christ said, I have prayed that it won't. And you're actually going to turn again. And you're going to strengthen your brothers. When you have turned again. This helps us understand what a failed faith is. So what is it? What is a failed faith? A failed faith. Faith is a faith that does not return again to the Lord after trial. A failed faith is a faith that once you put pressure on them, once you put pressure on them, they back out. Like who? Like Demas, who walked with Paul. And he went to multiple prisons with Paul. Second Timothy ends off by saying, Demas in love with this present world has gone to Thessalonica, the place where it's like a, a lot of people are there. He couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle it anymore. He dropped out. He's gone. He's in hell. It's also like the, the um, whatever, the, the parable of the seed and so. Thank you. Like being choked out. We're going there. Okay. We're going there. It's good that you see that. But let's go deeper. Think with me here. Which non-believers in the Bible? We just spoke about believers in the Bible getting sifted. Who are some believers in the Bible who got sifted? Peter. Job. Anyone else? Paul. Paul. Satan has sent a messenger. A thorn in the flesh. Paul. Not only that, he got prison. He got prison. David. Did you count that one? Possibly. We don't know. But we, I'm looking at clear verses where we see the word Satan there. Okay? Job with Satan. Very clear. Peter with Satan. Very clear. Paul, I have a messenger from Satan in my flesh to torment me. The Corinthians? There's some there. There's a guy in First Corinthians 5. Yeah. No, like in 11, whenever they were taking communion in an unworthy manner, some were handed over to Satan. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I think that's First Corinthians five, maybe if I'm mistaken, but there is it's in it's in Corinthians as well. But we're looking not just at people who went through trial, we're looking specifically at the word Satan when there's an involvement of Satan being someone being handed. We know believers who get sifted, but who are some non-believers in the Bible who also get sifted? Anyone? Judas. Yes, but I'm not thinking of him. Because we don't get a we don't get a clear word on. Yes, it says Satan entered him. But who else? So, not what I'm thinking of. Who? Huh? Who knows their First Timothy and Second Timothy well? You. Should I prepared for this study? Yeah. Who knows the names Hymenaeus and Alexander? All from Exodus. No. First Timothy and Second oh, Timothy. Oh, oh, it mentions your First Timothy. <laughs> From, yeah, no. The wizards. Yeah, they're talking about Jonas and Jonas. Yeah, the, sorry. No, not that. Alexander and Hymenaeus. Does anyone remember these names? They're only mentioned in, I believe, in First Timothy and Second Timothy. Listen to what it said about these guys. Listen. Holding faith and a good conscience. Paul is just telling them, you have to hold your faith. And what else? A good conscience. You have 
to hold it. And look what he says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. 1 Timothy 1, 19 to 20. You know what Paul correlates people with a failed shipwreck faith? People who have bad consciences. It says whoever rejects this makes shipwreck of their faith. Paul recognized you to make final shipwreck of your conscience, you're gone. Jesus recognized there is a place where people can officially fail their faith. He recognized that. He recognized that. But let me ask you guys this. Did Hymenaeus ever learn? Because it says, I'm handing him over to Satan that he may learn not to blaspheme. He was in sin. And Peter says, you go over to the consequences of, of your sin and let Satan do whatever he's allowed to do with you. Did Hymenaeus ever learn his lesson? He got sifted. Did he ever repent? Did Hymenaeus learn not to blaspheme when he was handed over to Satan? 2 Timothy answers that question. I just read a verse from 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. You know what Paul says about Hymenaeus? Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have gone astray from the truth. You know what he says? They've reached a point of no return. They're gone. They're done. It's over for their faith. They're flatlined. When a heart is flatlined, you don't recover. You don't recover. We're talking about sifting today, right? Hymenaeus is an example of a man who was sifted while under heavy trial and his faith failed. And he was a professor of the Lord Jesus Christ. He professed faith in him. Heavy sifting has actually failed the faith of many people more than you actually think. People who come to this church. You never know. You never know. It's a spiritual realm. It's a spiritual reality when these things occur. You could still be attending. You've already made shipwreck. And your conscience is a place of torment. And you've no longer held fast to the gospel of faith alone. When you think about shipwreck, so Paul uses the word shipwreck instead of fail. When a ship at that time was officially gashed against a rock, you don't, you can't use it anymore. I think it's like total under par. It's totaled. It's done. It's not a minor thing that you could go and fix. Ship wreck. The whole ship is wrecked. Can't even use it anymore. That's what he's saying. Can't even use it anymore. Heavy sifting is dangerous. It's dangerous. We spoke about how it is for a true believer. And we'll close off with how it is for the true believer. It's good. It's good. Because true Christians are people who persevere under trial. Who put suffering and suffering and suffering and trial and trial. They're going to fall, but they're going to get up. What did I say a failed faith is? A failed faith is if right now, People come in here and say, we're putting a gun to your head and shooting you. Do it. Do it. But the, but the false will say, uh-uh, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not going that far. Not me. Or they come in here and they, they don't shoot us. A slow torture. A slow torture. The people who have their heart set on the world. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Why do I mention that? Why do I mention suffering like that? Because as my brother said, you know who else's faith failed under heavy sifting? The false Christians in the parable of the sower. Jesus gave a parable. It's just describing the different types of reactions to the gospel. He says some, some seed was thrown on rocky ground. They just rejected it. They didn't go anywhere. Atheists. Those are atheists. There's two other categories. of It landed on soil. It actually began to grow. It never says it didn't grow. 
It just didn't go deep enough to take lasting root. But seed fell on the soil. Something grew. It was shallow soil. It wasn't good soil, but it grew. But it says for the second category of people, they accepted the gospel with joy. But when trials came around, they fell away. When, when things got hard, they fell away. And then there's a third category of people who, on the surface, yeah, I believe, of course, go to Bible study. Yes, I love Christ. But you know what else they love? They love that sin that they're not telling people behind the scenes. You know what it says? Those people get choked out by the cares and riches of this world. So two types of false faith could be broken in different ways. One false faith, you put great amount of suffering and pressure, they break. The other one, they break by the love and craving of this world. Okay? Now, why do I mention the second category of people who accepted, they, they, on the surface, they say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and they say it with joy. They say it with joy. But when trials come, it says they get choked out. They represent the false converts of our churches. The professing believers in the parable of the sower represent false Christians who fall away after being sifted with violent and heavy trials. Violent and heavy trials. I read about two women, two women, Rufina and Sukunda, year 200 in Rome, two women, two women. When, when things got really bad, when things got really bad and they were persecuting people in the city, Rufina and Sukunda, they had parents who they told them you know what they told them? Marry these two young men. They were also professors in Christ. They also believed faith. They said they believed in Christ. But whenever their city came under great persecution, those two men ended up denouncing their faith because they loved comfort. But those two women, women, stood Firm. And the authorities got them. And they began to torture them. One of the sisters, there were two sisters, they began scourging her back. You know what the other sister said? Why do you treat her honorably and me dishonorably? I confess that Jesus is God too. Wow, why do you treat her honorably by scourging her? I bear the name of Christ too. They got thrown in a dungeon. They died for Christ. They got their heads cut off for Christ. You saw those two, those two men in their life though, who also professed faith in Christ. They left. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. When heavy trial comes, this is what happens. That's what happens. The false will fall away, but the true, though they might fail, though they might fall, they will break down and weep bitterly, like Peter did, right? Because they truly want holiness. They're the righteous man who falls seven times and gets up eight. I'm not saying the true believer never falls. Oh, they could have big falls like Peter, guys. We can have great falls like Peter, guys. So, as we're approaching the end, sifting can result in the grain remaining or the chaff remaining. Either your faith gets strengthened or it gets destroyed. And as Messiah said, he read a verse. It says, count it all joy when trials approach, right? But why? You know why he says, count it all joy? Because you're going to see trial. If you're a true believer, you're going to see trials come. And you're going to see that you're undergoing these trials. And he says, get your joy from the fact that you know you're a true Christian because you're passing the trials. But trials on its own are not something to, be re to rejoice in. 
It's how you respond to those trials, right? It's how you respond to them. Because the trials are supposed to reveal what's on the inside. And, and who is that, James? James says that? James 1, yeah. And then James says, you see that suffering? You see yourself obeying? That's why you're supposed to take joy, because you're a true Christian. The testing of your faith is real. If I take everything away from you, you're still a true Christian. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Take hope. Look, even if you're falling into sin, but if you're a believer who hasn't denounced your faith and you, don't, you just want to stay with Christ, take comfort. The testing of your faith is real. The testing of your faith is real. The people who have to be worried is when the pressure comes. They're out. They're out. Nowhere does it teach that trials in and of themselves are what determines if you're right with God. Trials are here only to test to see what you're made of. Are you true or are you false? So therefore, just listen to this conclusion. For a believer and a non-believer, listen to this. What determines if sifting has been done successfully or fruitfully? What's, and I'm, we're, we're asking this question now. Whether you're a false Christian or a true Christian, if there's immense trial in your faith, if you're a believer, just listen as a believer. What determines if sifting has been done successfully or fruitfully? It's when someone repents and changes their way. If you're a true believer in sin and God is putting you through hell, you know how you know you're successfully going through that? Is if you repent and change your ways. It's not your job to figure out if you're being sifted or not. Because, you know, as we're talking to study, I don't want you to leave with that. I don't want you to, I don't want you to enter a maze that Christ doesn't want you to enter. Am I being sifted right now or am I not? You're, this is, that's never supposed to be your focus. It's your job to repent of what's wrong in your life. Right? Peter did not repent at this moment, but he would repent later. And that's why it's not a faith, a failed faith. If you come to Christ, will he cast you out? Never. He has a believer and a non-believer. John 6, 37. All who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Yes, that's talking about salvation. In its context, it's talking about salvation. No matter what sin you have, you come to me, I'll save your soul. Come to me. Just come to me. But it's the same way with the, with the believer. It's the same way with the believer. When Peter just broke and just made a wreck of what he just did. He just denied Christ three times. He didn't have a failed faith because he went back to Christ. He went back to Christ. Peter, like us, had to learn the hard way. And that's why he says in verse 33, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He's a true believer because at least he recognizes he's there for the long run. Give him some credit. He at least recognizes that I need to take up my cross and go all the way for him. And at that moment, this is just fleshly confidence he's going through. Fleshly confidence. Fleshly. It's just all of the flesh. I cannot, I, I can honestly say he did have some desire to die for Christ. But it's filled with arrogance. It's tainted. It's tainted with self-dependency. Peter, like us, had to learn the hard way. That's why Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster is not going to crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Notice how we called him Peter, right? Tell you, Peter. I tell you, comma, Peter. You know what Peter means? What does Peter mean? Yeah. The rock. Oh, you're a rock, huh? You're quite a rock. You're, you're so rock solid in your faith. You're going to deny me three times. There could be a subtle sarcasm here. Could be. His pride was so sewn into him. This was such a part of his personality. Did you ever think about this? His pride was so sewn into him that it took three denials to break him. You ever think about that? It wasn't once. He didn't break down and weep the first time. He didn't break down and weep a second time. In fact, do you know how long it took from the second denial to the third denial? Luke says it took one hour. In between denial two and denial three. An interval of one hour. How much time do you have to think in that time? 
How much time do you have to think and be in your own thoughts for an hour? But it was the third time when that, it says, while the rooster immediately crowed. And guess what it says in Luke's gospel? Not only did the rooster crow, but the Lord turned around and looked at Peter. And he broke, broke down. He broke down. That's it. Just imagine, we'll get there. But imagine that look Christ turned around and looked at him. No words. The look on its own shattered the man. Three denials was what it took to officially get the chaff out of Peter's soul. And guess what? It was successful. We spoke about it last time, but he, they, him and all the disciples never fell into this sin again. Why do I mention the other disciples? If you look at verse 31, if you have NASB or LSB or some other translation, or even, I believe, NIV, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you all like wheat. Did your Bible say that? Um, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you all like wheat. No, it just says uh, sift you. Okay, but many, tra the, many translations say sift you all because the word in the Greek is in plural. That for, only for the first verse. But for verse 32, okay, here's if you want to look at the Greek and how this is formatted, verse 31, it says Simon, Simon, but it's referring to the other disciples as well. Verse 32 is only referring to Peter. Because the, the, the word you and your in verse 32 is singular. The, ver the word you in verse 31 is plural. So Satan not only had Peter in mind, he had the rest in mind. That's why Christ says, you will all fall away. You will all fall away. So what can we close off with? This is the final conclusion. Believer or non-believer, the purpose of sifting is to refine true faith and to destroy false faith. Amen? Amen. It's to refine a true faith and to expose and destroy false faith. That's the purpose of sifting. That's the purpose of sifting. And also this, everyone in this room, no one is exempt from being sifted. The enemy's desire is to sift all of God's children, and there is no promise given to us from God that we shall escape a sifting of the devil, similar to that which Job experienced. Death, destruction, or poverty might strike at any time in any of our lives. And while first things might appear to be gloomy and dark, if you're a true believer, my brother, my sister, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, though you can't see it. No one is, is exempt from this. Job got sifted. Peter got sifted. Those people are polar opposites. One claimed to be the greatest, Peter. One was the greatest in the land at that time, Job 1.3. And not only is anyone exempt from sifting, But you can get sifted at any time without notice. Only, I'm guys, only these guys got notice <laughs> that they're about to be sifted. And they didn't listen. The rest of us, we never get a word from it. Even Job never got a word from it. He never was told, oh, by the way, I spoke to Satan about you. <laughs> I mean, he got to heaven and he found out the whole story. But the rest of us, you're never going to get informed on if it's a sifting or whatever it is. You know why? It's not your goal. It's not your... You're never supposed to get your mind to, am I being sifted right now? It's your job to repent of whatever is wrong in your life. And as long as we have sin in us, we are always able to get sifted. Let's be on guard, guys. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. 1 Peter 5, 8. We're now done with this story, but as for Peter... His story is not done yet. He's going to come back in Luke 22. This was just a prophecy today. We're going to see him. It'll be in 2023 when we get to that study. We do now. When Satan <laughs> devours Peter himself. So why don't we close off and play?
Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you please keep us sober-minded and watchful the rest of this week and following. That's my one request. Keep us watchful. Individually, keep us on guard, sober-minded, alert, never spiritually slothful, clinging to your word and clinging to prayer. You must give that to us. Give it to us, Lord. Make us sober-minded, alert, on guard, watchful at all times. As we approach this week, let us walk carefully. But you must give that to us. Please give that to us. Give it to us, Lord. May that study. Whatever we do after this study, control our tongues. Control our minds. Make us humble. Let us look at others with more significance. Grow our love. Convict us of any sins that we need to repent of. I just ask that you would, in this fellowship time, that you be present in this room. And let us go home safely, Lord, if that be in your will. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive mine. And let your face shine upon us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.